I'd like to start with a brief anecdote. Besides celebrating our 167th birthday, and I'm not inviting you to sing happy birthday, uh, we have a history here that some of you don't know. This is an unusual event that we have such heavy rain. We're very lucky we don't have snow. But usually Marymount events never had rain or inclement weather. And this, of course, took place during the 30-year reign of Sister Michella. We don't know what it was, but she had a power. It worked perfectly throughout her whole tenure until the day of her burial. That morning, it rained cats and dogs like this. And I was the superior of the house, or whatever the title is, and I remember driving down George Mason Drive, and I'm saying, Magella, you know, disrespectfully, Magella, for God's sake, make the rain stop. <laughs> By the time we got to the cathedral, it stopped, and we had sun. I don't think I have the power for that today, so I'm sorry, but anyway, a warm welcome. It is our 167th birthday as religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, and in this five-year cycle of doing, this is the fifth year, in the five-year cycle of doing this, this is the first time this luncheon, this whole celebration has fallen on the actual date of our founding. We were founded on the 24th of the month, and it actually represents the day that the two co-founders actually opened the foundation of the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary. That would be Father Gayak, whose picture is in one of the windows up there, and Mother St. John, who's sitting, who's sitting, standing, you know, in the habit next to her. So it is the official 24th, 167th birthday. So I thank you for all your wonderful singing. Don't you dare sing it. <laughs> the other thing that's very important is, as I brought up, this is a sequence of five years, and it started off rather simply. And we've had five different sisters, and I've chosen each of them for specific reasons. I. I've done it in concert with other people, but I sort of had a little thing in my head. When I addressed this to Catherine and asked her to be the person to speak this year, I shared with her this story. I said, you are in this sequence. First we had the history, then we had the story of Father Gayak, then we had the mother house. Last year we had Sister Veronica with the NGO. Where do we go with this? And I said, this is my vision. This good lady has been in the leadership of our community several times in and out as a local leader, in the old days, they were called superiors, OK? She has been in our province, and we belong to a province or a region known as the Eastern American province. And several years ago, she was selected to be on what we call the General Council. And that is the leadership oversight all the way in Rome. And they see all of us in the, is it 17 or 18 countries? I know it's four continents, and I forget a few other details. So I asked her to be like a bird that she's flying over this institute, this congregation spread in so many places with ministries that are responsive to the places where our sisters are. And to come back and show all of us how this fits in with the underlying mission of our community to know God and to make God known and loved. It is also very much in keeping with the lines from St. John's Gospel that they may have life. And so with that bit of information to you, I want to present to you a person whose CV, you know, I cut out pieces. It will speak to itself as you hear her. She's going to speak to us on the RSHM, where we are today, where we see our mission moving from whence it has come, from that foundation in a little town in the south of France known as Bayesian, through the European continent, and quickly to the United States in 1877, and then the founding of our local Marymount here in 1950. So with great love, may I pre present our local regional superior, also known as the provincial, Sister Catherine Patton. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Sister Jackie. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Um, a lot of my early life was in higher education, and that never gets out of your system somehow, you know. And I, I still serve on the board of, of uh, Marymount Manhattan, and of course on the boards of our schools in Europe. So, education is in my lifeblood. So I thought it'd be interesting to begin thinking about 
how we RSHM think about having one mission, but within a great diversity of ministries. When I began doing this, I wrote pages about the whole question of identity and inclusion and all the, these things that are going on in our own society. And then I threw them away and said, keep focused. <laughs> uh, but of course, this does relate to larger, larger questions that are coursing through our whole world right now. <clears throat> But even we who spend a lot of time thinking about all of this have to keep reminding ourselves of the difference between our mission to know God and to make God known, to love God and to make God loved, and to proclaim that Jesus Christ has come that all may have life, and our specific and diverse ministries, for example, education in which we engage. And since we're celebrating the 160th, 67th anniversary of our foundation, it may be helpful to look at this question from our beginnings. <clears throat> and I'm borrowing here for the history from the work of uh, Sister Kathleen Connell, who's on your board, and also Sister Catherine Vincy, uh, another of our theologians. <clears throat> what was important to the young Gayak was to create the conditions in which, through a life of dignity, people could know God better and thus experience God's saving mercy and love. For him, the young women of the refuge, and this was a shelter that he had begun for abandoned women and prostitutes in the city of Béziers, the orphans, he had started an orphanage for the same reason, the sick and all who sought him in the confessional or in preaching were his people. Uh, part of the history, Béziers was what was called a sanctuary city, an open city in the south of France, and even today it's not considered the most prestigious part of France. It's a very interesting city with ancient Roman ruins and so on. But at the same time, because it has this history of being an open city, it's where criminals could go and avoid prosecution. Uh, and it's on the main road from Spain uh, along the Mediterranean to Nice and so on. So you had all of the problems that come with that kind of a location. This is a picture of the Hotel Dieu in 1895, which is, <clears throat> Gayak was uh, dead by this time, uh, and this building is better looking than the one he actually served in. Uh, but his first ministry was to serve the poor and sick in a hospital in Béziers called the Hotel Dieu. And he ministered here for 21 years, from 1828 to 1849, when we were founded, in the prime of his life. His ministry in this place of very rudimentary medical care involved comforting and accompanying the sick, listening to their stories of pain and grief, hearing their confessions, and assuring the dying of God's infinite mercy. The Hotel Dieu is a stark reminder of Gayak's dedication to the works of mercy in the most trying circumstances, and of his realization that when he's doing God's will, God's grace will be there for him. The shift from this kind of ministry to founding a religious congregation, at which point he put all his energy into forming the new congregation, uh, is significant because he was totally focused on these works for the poorest of the poor. And he had rejected a seminary post at the very beginning of his career saying, no, I want to work with the very poor. Uh, so this is the history. You heard a reference to Mayor St. Jean. This is a picture of her as a, a young person. Um, she was named Apolloni, and her husband was Eugene Cure. So when Apolloni and her husband Eugene moved to Béziers in 1836, they resumed their relationship with Eugene's childhood friend, Father Gayak. As a childless couple, eager to find a way to serve God and humanity, they decided to help Gayak not only for friendship's sake, but also because, in their opinion, Gayak had the best plan for meeting the critical needs in the city of Béziers. Therefore, Eugene and Apolloni decided to provide the funds that would make Gayak's dreams a reality. It is true to say that they, as Gayak's friends, were the first to recognize and to share his charism to make his works of zeal and mercy possible. After Eugene's sudden death, in November of 1848, Apolloni continued the joint benefaction that she and her husband had begun. In fact, it's interesting to reflect on, she immediately when he died, she said to Father Gayak, Eugene and I had agreed on this, so I'm going to offer myself for your works. 
And he said, you're, oh, you're in grief. This isn't the time to do this. And she insisted she even went to the bishop and got, got permission. And so by February, she was the foundress of this new religious congregation. There were very touching letters back and forth, very human letters of her to Father Gayak. They lived in the same town, but they wrote letters every day. That's how it was in France. You know? uh, where she's saying, oh, I'm so sad, and I miss, you know, I miss my home, I miss my bed, all these things. And he was very human and gentle with her and helped her to get through this time. Um, so you may know that the original plan was for the congregation to help care for the women who were in the refuge, basically a shelter. But within the first year, it became clear that the new sisters couldn't manage these women. There was outright rebellion when uh, Apollonie Cure, who was an upper class educated woman, went into this shelter of homeless women. And they really, they had to call the police. It was very bad. At the same time, in the same year, France passed a law allowing uh, Catholic education again. This was after the Napoleonic era and all the different, the empires and uh, laicite and that whole development in 19th century France. So Gayak realized that the RSHM that he had had the gifts and training to run a school and they didn't have the gifts and training to run a shelter. So he opened a boarding school, a ministry in itself and also a support for the other works. That pragmatism of Gayak is really one of the things that is our heritage. If this isn't working, well then you try this. This is a, pic a drawing of the early mother house. Over time, Mer Saint John used her inheritance to buy contiguous pieces of land and to build the mother house with the four-storied wings that you see in this picture. Starting from the left was the boarding school and the entrance to the large park across the street, just at the bottom of the screen, a beautiful park that goes down to the river. Um, and actually, we just sold this in the past year to the ministry with foster children in France that still continues. The last remaining ministry in Béziers actually begun by Father Gayak. Uh, then the second wing was the novitiate wing for young people in training to be sisters. The community wing was the next. Then there was a wing for the orphans in the orphanage. And then the far right, the wing for the preservation and the oblate sisters. So you see how each of those wings, they were segmented into class groups, which of course is what how French society was organized at the time. But they were all, all these classes of society were together in the one ministry. So this mother house, in a way, shows the unity and the diversity of the works at our origins. This is a picture of Gayak with his administrative council in the year 1881-82. By this time, the works originally centered in the mother house had spread to foundations beyond Bézier. And think about this. In Lisbon, Northern Ireland by 1870, Porto in Portugal, 1871, Boodle, which is near Liverpool in England in 1872, Braga in the north of Portugal in 1877, Sag Harbor in 1877, and Ferrybank in Ireland in 1879. So within that 10-year period, we were in all these different countries, this enormous kind of glo global outreach. We claim this missionary movement today um, as our commitment to internationality, a global vision, local concern, but a global vision. And the question then and now is, how do you hold all these many works together? Gayak's answer was clear in his time and in our own. There are really not many works, but just one work, the work of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we are called to continue the pa compassionate, merciful, redeeming work of Jesus Christ in our time. This answer reveals how deeply Gayak was shaped by what we now call the French school of spirituality or the Berulian school. It swept through 19th century France and led to the foundation of literally hundreds of religious congregations in a 50-year period. As some of us have rediscovered this movement and learned about it, we've recognized the roots of our own charism in it. <clears throat> some characteristics of this movement were that it was a spirituality more than it was a theology. It was a belief that mysticism, direct relationship with God, was open for everyone not just the preserve of the clergy and the religious. It focused on Jesus as the word incarnate, 
in whom we become one with God. It included deep devotion to Mary, often using the symbol of the Sacred Heart of Mary. There are loads of congregations that were begun dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Sacred Heart of Mary, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary, the Hearts of Jesus and Mary, I mean, endless, that all come out of this same period in France. Renewal of the priesthood, which was in a pretty sad state in France at that time, was a central concern, as was Eucharistic devotion. There was an emphasis on adoration and awareness of our finitude before God. There was an emphasis, uh, excuse me, uh, in scripture, the preference was for John's gospel and the letters of Paul, uh, rather than the synoptic gospels. Commitment to the universal church uh, was a very important question for Gayak. When he was a young boy, the struggle was that the desire to create a French national church which would separate from the universal church. This was a great controversy. He stood on the side of remaining with the universal church, the ultramontane uh, controversy. Uh, and he also believed that the ministry should be directly with the materially poor. If you think of St. Vincent de Paul, if you think of some of the Salesians, some of these, these movements are connected. Uh, so there was adoration and worship of God and care for the materially poor. What's not here, and which has become very important in our day, is the following of Jesus to build the reign of God. That, that idea of constructing the reign in historical circumstance wasn't the frame in which the gospel was, was thought about. So there are really not many works, but just one work, the work of Jesus Christ, and it continues uh, in us in many different ways. As Gaiac negotiated with the Vatican to have our first rule approved by the Holy See, the church pressed us to narrow the scope of his vision and to be more specific about our works. When the church adopted a universal code of canon law in 1918, most religious congregations had their ministries defined primarily as teaching and or nursing, and usually in church institutions. There was a, a real focusing down. Remember that picture of the mother house with the different wings devoted to the different works that served all classes of 19th century French society, from prostitutes to the well-to-do in the boarding school? In every country where we made new foundations, the model of having a school for the wealthy that supported the works for the poor continued. For example, when Mother Butler asked the Archdiocese of New York for permission to start a private school for girls, which became the first Marymount, the Cardinal made assuming the responsibility for St. Thomas Aquinas Parochial School in the South Bronx a condition for permission, excuse me, for permission to open the new school. This was not a reluctantly accepted condition. In every place in the United States where we had a Marymount, we also accepted responsibility for staffing a parochial school, sometimes more than one. And in the early 20th century, most parochial schools provided free Catholic education for immigrant children. That was the socioeconomic context. That model served us well enough until the church at the Second Vatican Council asked us to constantly return to the sources of all Christian life and to the original spirit of their institutes and their adaptation to the changed conditions of our time. So it sent us back to the Gospels. It sent us to historical research to understand some of this information about Gaia we really didn't know, we hadn't kept. And it also asked us to adopt to what was the actual condition today. That's the project that certainly religious women, all religious congregations, but certainly religious women embarked on. And we who are now of a certain age lived through this whole process. So that question meant asking who are those who are in great need now? And one of the changed conditions was that the Catholic immigrants that we had served, primarily of Irish and Italian heritage, had now moved into the mainstream of society. They were no longer the poor and the marginalized, 
even among Catholics, because the younger Catholic immigrants came from other socioeconomic and ethnic backgrounds. I want to share a story with you. In 1980, when we were in the throes of renewal, we had a general chapter. This was elected delegates gather in Rome. It's like the, the mini ecumenical uh, council of a religious congregation. And what you do is you assess the mission of the institute and make guidelines for the next six years, and you elect your new leadership team. Um, we met for a whole summer in Rome, working to finalize our new constitutions. We'd been through a two-year process of everybody looking at them and responding and so on. My memories of that summer are just suffused with feelings of heat and sweltering. It was really, we were sort of locked in. However, uh, about midway through the week, we had a terrible conflict, an absolute deadlock. And it was over this very question. Is our mission solely that of education and schools, or does our mission include a diversity of ministries? It was very serious. In the United States, we were feeling some of this tension, but the question was really acute for our sisters from Brazil. That province had, like us, been involved almost totally in schools, but now some sisters wanted to leave the schools to serve the poor in Comunidades de Base. We also are in Mozambique and in Portugal and in um, Zimbabwe. All of those countries were in the midst of revolution. Most of them were, went through revolutions in about 1975. So we were profoundly affected by those experiences. We all took two days out of the meetings and we were sent off to pray, while three sisters from different provinces who had studied the sources were asked individually to reflect on the question without talking to one another. On the third day, we assembled and we listened as each of them gave testimony uh, to what they knew. Sister Kathleen Connell, if you know her, you know that she can really tell a story. She describes this as the great cloud of witnesses that came to us. Uh, and every time she tells the story, it gets a little more elaborated. You know. uh, one time I said to her, was I there? You know. <laughs> But each of them, it was a very dramatic moment, however, and each of them affirmed that for Gayak there was only one work, the work of Jesus Christ, and that from our origins we had a diversity of ministries. That was really something. So our constitutions say, that's the cover of the constitutions, our founders' faith vision unifies our mission, which according to our tradition is expressed in a diversity of ministries as we undertake whatever work could contribute to the glory of God and the salvation of persons. That was the original formulation in the first constitutions, which the Vatican wouldn't accept because it was too broad. And we go on in the next article to say, we share the deep love of Jean Gayak for the poor, faithful to our heritage, attentive to the signs of the times and the call of the church. We are committed to the service of evangelical justice wherever we are, and whatever our ministry. Every six years, we have one of these general chapters, which provides focus to these broad goals in the constitutions. Our most recent chapter in 2013 asked us to open our hearts to a new global consciousness, one perspective, engage with others involved in changing unjust structures by collaboration, advocacy, and networking, more specifically, we're asked to be attentive to respect for the earth and sustainability, to work against human trafficking, in particular through our work at the United Nations, and to integrate insights from science and cosmology into our theology and spirituality. That's one of the really great um, challenges of our time. In the 36 years since the Constitution, this is the, um, the cover of the document from the chapter. And as you see, it's all in English and Portuguese because those are the two primary languages in the Institute. In the 36 years since the constitutions were written, we have diversified significantly. You know that well because Sister Maria Timoney, who is on your board here, volunteered to go from being the director of admissions at Marymount College in Tarrytown to found a mission in Southwest Virginia. This decision eventually led her to law school and a ministry as a legal aid attorney. Sister Jackie here made her decision to move to nursing and eventually to her ministry with hospice. 
Sister Bridget Driscoll, also on your board, after serving as a math professor and later president of Marymount College in Tarrytown, now teaches at Bedford Hills, the only maximum security prison for women in New York State, a college program sponsored by Marymount Manhattan College. We're really proud of this program. And if you go to that graduation, you, you just have to cry. I mean, it's it just really one of the most moving things. And the college has also committed to accepting into the college any women who've been in the program who haven't yet finished and who are released. Uh, and that has been a very good experience. And in fact, now, and I haven't found out the details of how this is working, but students from Marymount Manhattan College can actually go up to the prison and take some classes in the prison with the women there. It's a wonderful initiative. So it's still education, but with a little different uh, perspective. Sister Bridget is also on the board of Lifeway, a coalition of religious congregations, this is in the New York area, but there are similar ones in other areas, who are working against human trafficking, especially of women. One of the things that I've realized is that the gifts that some of us bring because we were trained to be educators, of course, transfer incredibly into some of these other situations. For example, Sister Bridget is chairing the fundraiser for the Lifeway Coalition this year, and I can just see she's had all this experience in college work. She knows exactly how to do this sort of thing and to get more people invited and to spread the word and to um, to do a, a very significant job. But she knows it because she has all this other experience at the college level. So we continue to feel at times the tension between our unity as one institute and the diversity of our ministries. But I think it's fair to say that we have grown into valuing the richness that that very tension brings. And I just end with this. It's very difficult to see. It's a little holy card. But what it's of is actually a weaving that Sister Bianca Haglich, one of our uh, artists in Tarrytown, that is one piece of woven cloth, and it hangs in the stairwell at the mother house. And it depicts Gayak with the world and the heart at the center. And it, you see the whole French school there, don't you? The praise, the sacred heart, and so on, and rootedness. And the bottom says, uh, to listen to the spirit at the heart of the world. Thank you. This will be my last time to say this publicly, but I'm Father Tom, I'm the new guy. <laughs> uh, but sister, thank you so much. What a beautiful reflection. I, I feel like I've learned so much, especially as the new guy, uh, but hopefully all of us have about thank the you. origins of the founders of Marymount. And of course, knowing where we come from helps us to know where we want to go. And uh, what a beautiful reflection about how uh, the, there's many ministries, but one, one mission yes. and the mission of the you founder. And um, our, our job is to find ways to make that mission practical today. But I want to invite Dr. McMurdoch up to say a few words. You want me to say? Sister Catherine, um, we are very honored and pleased to have you here today. And we just wanted to share with you a gift of our appreciation for your time and taking uh, a few moments to reflect on your history and share with us where you think the, uh, the RSHM are going and what our challenges are to here today. So thank, thank you. you very much. You're most welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And one thing I have learned already is that it's a privilege accorded to university presidents and reserved by them to have the last word. So <laughs> if I can invite Dr. Shanka. Thanks, Father Tom. I, I will be very brief and just add a few words of thanks. First of all, uh, thanks to Father Tom. We are very blessed to have him here, and even in his short time, is already making a difference uh, in terms of our students, faculty, and staff, and he's going to do some outstanding work in, in moving us forward with our Catholic identity. So, Father, thank you and, and the staff and students of campus ministry, all those who had a role in making today's event successful, and there are other events that hopefully you will attend uh, the remainder of the week. So, Father, thank you for being with us. Uh, also, wherever she went, Sister Jackie was just here. Um, How do you know? Oh, right in front of me, sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't once again thank Sister Jackie and Sister Jacqueline uh, and all those RSHM who came before to, to found the school and to be with us still today uh, to grow the school. So I, I would like a round of applause for Sister Jackie and Sister Jacqueline. 